When, what is meant by negative affect? And these aren't well defined either, but there's anger, and anger arises, as you know, in situations that are perceived as unjust. Uh, it has physiological components or concomitants. These are more sustained if the anger is not expressed. I did an experiment where we had people talk about a, an event that made them anger, angry, and we had them, it had to be something that was unresolved. So that as they talked about it, and these people had just had radionuclide scans of their hearts and they had some heart disease. And we said, it, we discovered if you talked to that somebody about something that made them angry but it was resolved, it's like a story and they know the punchline. So the heart doesn't get involved. But if it's unresolved, then people can talk about it. And their whole body, it's like the body doesn't know. And it doesn't have Webster's or something, so it just goes right back through it. And we showed what happened to the heart when people talked about these things, and we got this terrible left ventricular dysfunction that was worse than when people exercised. And the people had just exercised, so they, the cardiologist said, you can never do this again to anybody. Do not have people talk about angry events that haven't been resolved because it's really dangerous. So we never got to do, we couldn't replicate the study. It, was, it had adverse events. It was doing what that happens to us. So try to resolve all of your anger, and that's what's so good about forgiveness. <laughs> um, depression is produced by loss of support and reinforcement, and it's often associated with diminished activity, and it's often thought of anger turned inward. This is kind of like nav negative affect. Hostility is related to that. Is this related to disease? This is the first thing you try to show. Is it related? And some of you know all this. So I tried to pick studies that are kind of interesting. There was the religious orders study. How many of you know this well? Don't raise your hands. Uh, it's, there were 851 clergy in the study. <laughs> Judy raises her hand. She knows everything. She is so smart. The average age in the study was 75. And these individuals had a good deal of suppressed anger and depression, some of them. And so. <laughs> unresolved something or others. And so but anyway, they studied those. They looked at those, the group that had the most suppressed anger and depression um, within four years' time, just in four years, was significantly associated with mortality, higher mortality, than, and they did all the kind of adjustments that one needs to do in studies. So they found a very strong relationship. Uh, there have also been community-based studies of depression and cardiac mortality. In one study, there was only 2,847 people. And what they did was they assessed them on depression and then again looked to see whether or not they were more likely to, um, what their death rates were over time. And what they found was people with major depression, the, more, the risk was more than double. This slide, and I will use the pointers, I was told to not discriminate, so I'll start over here. Here, there, you have both people that came into the study had no coronary heart disease that was known, as well as people here on the right that had heart disease, no disease and heart disease. And then if you look at the yellow bars, those are the people with, who were diagnosed with major depression. So even in healthy individuals here uh, with no heart disease, if a person had major depression, the likelihood over the follow-up period was sig significantly greater that a person would um, ha have both cardiac deaths and CHD deaths, general cardiovascular deaths versus CHD deaths. It's really striking. So it suggests that depression, just like anger and hostility, are related to increased risk. And this study um, just came out uh, two weeks ago. Um, hostility and mortality, there was the Women's Health Initiative, many of us know this study well, had 107,000 women in the study. And because of some of these behavioral medicine people who got into that study, there were, happened to be some measures of hostility and also of optimism, which I'll tell you about later. And what you see here is that women that scored high on cynical hostility, had uh, there were more deaths per 10,000 women in this group than those who scored lower in cynical hostility. Cynical hostility is sort of like, they'll get you. You can't really trust people. You know, you really need to know where people are from. When you meet them at the first time, you want to know, where did they go to school? You know, should I take them seriously? Are they going to be a threat to me? It has a lot of competitiveness in it. It's sort of real, it's very high among the type A people. And I'll tell you about the optimists later. So the question is, how do these negative states get into the body? And they're, you know, you can do this many ways. I'm going to just touch on three pathways, and then we'll do the same for positive. This is, a, there's a lot of research in this area. First way it can get into the body is through physiological pathways. And here's the, that you all have been talking about for the, I think the last couple days, I was just in a session where they were talking some about this, that there are 
thought to be, particularly with EEG, reliable individual differences in electrophysiological measures of um, prefrontal brain activity. And I'm going to give you a few teasers for the spectacular keynote. Uh, I'm the, sort of the warm-up act. And the spectacular keynote this afternoon from Dr. Richard Davidson, who is making me incredibly nervous, sitting in the front row over here. Um, so in every hard question, we go like this to Richie. Um, but they showed that there were these. There's a. There seems to be associate different um, regions in the prefrontal uh, cortex associated with positive and negative states, and he more than anyone has really advanced that field. Negative states, particularly depression, seem to be associated with being on the right side of things, which I always think about. I go, how can I possibly re remember that the hostility and the depression are on the right side and over on the left side, the, where we can make change happen, is associated with being positive. I don't know how I could possibly do that. Um, and so just to touch on Richie's uh, people with right-sided activation in his incredible research and his team showed they had lower basal cells of N NK cell activity, basal levels of NK cell activity, greater decreases in NK function. I hope I got this right. I was looking to make sure I get it right. It's like having an exam. So I wonder how my NK function is going. Less rise in NK function to positive film clips. In other words, these uh, the left-sided or the right-sided folks that have this um, the, this negative affect or showing all kinds of things it's associated with negative affect and then you're seeing this diminished um, um, immune function and actually lower antibody titers to influenza vaccine. It's very intriguing findings to sort of begin to put these pieces together. What could be the pathways by which um, these, you know, that the negative affect could be producing this, we might have think about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access because that is the neuroendocrine system that oversees things like cardiovascular reactivity to stress, uh, digestion, think about irritable bowel function, immune system. That's a very important pathway. Um, and also, you, I'll be mentioning a bit about the stress hormone of cortisol. Also, so we think that there are also neuroendocrine systems that are at play, and the nervous system is clearly involved. Another pathway that makes all so much sense, but also makes it tricky to study this, is health behaviors, because it turns out that people that are depressed or angry tend to engage in less healthy behavior. And we all know that some of these behaviors are associated with increased risk of disease. For example, depression has been associated with poor um, health behaviors, including heavier alcohol intake, more sedentary be uh, behavior. They're more likely to smoke. They have, this is a real important area, though it's one I've studied and it's a little boring, but it sometimes pays the bills, which is non-adherence. When people are depressed, they tend not to adhere to care. So they don't take the medicines. They also might be at risk for not showing up to some of our groups and may need a little more of our interaction with them to keep them engaged. Because when people get depressed, remember the association with inactivity. And this is a real challenge for those medicines. And so that is another backdoor passageway from the conservatory to the library is that you can talk to MDs about how you can help them with adherence. And then before you know it, they're talking about depression. And before you know it, they're talking about other things. So these, um, all these behaviors have effects on heart disease and other, other illnesses. Let me talk about the UNC alumni study. It's sort of interesting we're talking about University of North Carolina this week. Uh, this isn't about basketball. Duke, I know, I know. Um, anyway, the UNC it used to be all men. I didn't know that. And when these guys would come to you know, uh, apply for college, they had to fill out questionnaires. And they would get all these personality measures on everyone that sort of went into some archive. And Eileen Ziegler is following these people up 30 years later and beyond. And so she's, she can look at, say, depression or hostility of someone when they were 18 years old and what has happened to their life as they live longer. And she's found that these people, that people that were hostile on these early questionnaires are more likely to have excessive alcohol intake as adults, higher depression, and I'll talk about one other finding in a few minutes. So these are life lifelong uh, tendencies which I actually do believe and I will go out on a limb, this is the limb, uh, that MBSR and those kinds of things could actually, if timed right, and this is one of the things we have to find out is when do we do this? Do we do it with very young people? But that you could, you can shift these trajectories.